And so I'm going to ask Nigel to go back to our PowerPoint, and we're looking at Galatians chapter 4. That's in your Bible, Galatians chapter 4. And let's look at the section actually beginning in verse 8 of our Messianic studies in Galatians. So Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, you remember the context, of course, in that the uh, churches of the region of Galatia, Galatia is not just one church, it was a region, there were maybe as many as five to seven churches in that area, small churches, or some of them could have been large. And uh, Paul was writing to basically correct the mistaken notion that these believers had that somehow they had to keep Mosaic law. Again, these were individuals who had come from non-Jewish backgrounds for the most part. Yeah. I'm sure that some in some of the congregations, there were some Jewish believers. We see that at the end of Galatians, in Galatians 6, there is an indication that there were some Jewish believers there. But the majority, by far, were people from non-Jewish backgrounds who had become a little bit overly impressed by the legalizers, the false teachers who had come down from Jerusalem. These were guys who were uh, most likely of the Pharisaic persuasion. Uh, they had made professions of faith that Jesus was the Messiah. <clears throat> so they, um, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they are believers. Uh, perhaps they were not. There are good arguments, pro and con. I've read them all. The, the thing that we need to remember is that these folks were putting their personal convictions and their preferences to be equal with scripture. And that's the problem. When you elevate your personal preferences to be on the level with scripture or even above scripture, then that becomes a promise. And that's simply called legalism. The, the laws and the preferences you have for yourself, you attempt to make that binding on others. In this case, of course, with the Mosaic law, they had a help in that for the nation of Israel, during the time of, before the cross, Mosaic law was the rule of life. Again, Paul himself says the law is good, holy, and just. But then, of course, Messiah is better. Messiah was the goal. Messiah was the, the, the thing that the law was looking forward to. And within the law itself, in Jeremiah 31, is the very clear prediction that there would come a day when uh, believers would not be having a rule of life that was Mosaic law, but God would put a new covenant and write it on their hearts. You and I, as born-again believers in Messiah Jesus, are partakers of that new covenant. It is still something that is, in its full um, form, is still yet in the future, but its spiritual benefits are available here and now. That's why Jesus himself said at the Last Supper, as he opened up the Passover for them, the cup and the bread, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so that is something that is very per, uh, pertinent, something that we need to uh, recognize is a reality. And so directing your attention again to Galatians chapter 4. Just give me a minute here. Okay. Galatians chapter 4, in verse 8, he takes them to task. He compares their current status as believers to what they used to be as non-believers, as individuals who were bound to paganism. They had a relationship to, to idols. You see that in your in your full, in, filled in outline here, number one. Formerly, they were slaves to idols. Uh, presently, the Gentiles have now been liberated by their knowledge of God. Chapter 4, verse 9. There was a complete change in their orientation. And so that is the reality of, of their life now. 
And so that's something that we need to be very aware of. We also say here in verse, uh, cha in verse 9, I'm sorry, that these Gentile believers were returning to a sort of slavery of a different type. They were slaves to idols. That was before they came to faith in Messiah. But now they are kind of putting a yoke of bondage upon themselves needlessly by imagining that somehow Mosaic law had to be this yoke. Um, I'm going to ask, I, don't know, I think someone's mic is on. Maybe Nigel, your mic is on, but we're hearing it a little bit. So if that can be muted, very good. Okay, so let's go forward here. Where this is kind of where we left off. And we had left off talking about the fact that they were making themselves slavery to not only Mosaic law, but here's the real crux of the matter. You see, these false teachers, these Pharisaic false teachers, are they were not only promoting Mosaic law, but they were also promoting rabbinic tradition. In addition to the 613 commandments of Mosaic law, there is an entire body of traditions that became attached to Mosaic law. And in the New Testament, these are called, quote unquote, the traditions of the elders. Whenever you see the phrase, the traditions of the elders, what that has reference to was a body of rules and regulations that at that time it was primarily in a verbal sort of form <clears throat> excuse me but were at the that moment in the process of being written down and oftentimes when jesus and the pharisees locked horns it was over this issue of the authority of the traditions of the elders you see the pharisees especially those in judea could not imagine that you knew enough to keep the law of God without their traditions. And so they felt that, well, you have to obey our traditions as well. After all, um, who was going to teach you how to obey these 613? Because as you read those 613 commandments, the reality is that many of them, or at least some of them, are subject to some interpretation. And so here is the crux of it. When God chose to remain silent and not expand on it, the rabbis imagined that they needed to help God out by filling in what he forgot. I'm being cute here, but that is essentially the chutzpah, the, the gall that some of the Pharisees had when it came to trying to add to Mosaic law. And so as a result, A, here in the PowerPoint, they were now in slavery to mandatory, and here are some of the fill-ins, to mandatory Mosaic law festivals. Now, we need to once again kind of split this and, 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 and be careful about this. The, the calendar that God gave of having these festivals, the, the seven holy days of Israel, the seven holy feasts, as is seen in Leviticus 23, there's nothing wrong with that calendar. It is God's calendar, and I would actually argue that it's still the calendar in effect by which God rules the earth. He still arranges time by means of that calendar. It's God's calendar. The, the Old Testament Jewish feast days have much to teach us. Again, for 17 years, I served as either a senior Messianic pastor or associate Messianic pastor at a good-sized Messianic Jewish congregation in the New York City area. And we happily participated in the celebration of the Jewish Holy Days. But we did it in a way that put grace first. We didn't do these things in an effort to play synagogue. Neither did we do them with the mistaken idea that somehow if we did them, we were gaining points in heaven, that somehow we were obligated. It was obligatory to do these things. But rather, we were doing them in the light 
of the fact that Messiah has come. And now we can actually see the ultimate fulfillment of these holy days. The fact that each one of them has a, a place in pointing to Messiah. And so uh, there's nothing wrong with keeping these holidays. But what was happening was that these Galatian believers were being led to believe by the false teachers that it was an obligation and that somehow their very standing before God was in peril if they did not do that. And so he says here in uh, verse 11, he says, you are, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Um, the days were the Sabbaths, every seven days, the Sabbath day. Again, the Sabbath is an institution that has not changed. Uh, you know, and to put it this way, not to get anyone nervous, you know, but people argue and they talk, what is the Sabbath day? Well, you will not find a single verse in the Bible that says that God ever changed the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was, the Sabbath is, and the Sabbath will always be the seventh day of the week. Um, the Bible never talks about something known as a Christian Sabbath day. The idea that there is a day of rest, and for many in the Western Christian world, it is Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that idea. I'm not teaching against that. And if you are residing in a culture in which uh, that is recognized, that's fine. If you want to make your day of rest Tuesday, that's fine as well. Why do people say Sunday? Because they would point to the idea, true of course, that the resurrection happened on a Sunday. And they would go from that fact that the resurrection happened on a Sunday, and then they would try to stretch that fact to try to push you to the idea that Sunday is the new Christian Sabbath. And of necessity, they then have to disenfranchise Saturday as the Sabbath. That's the problem. Saturday was, is, and will always be the Sabbath. It's the seventh day of the week. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh, he rested. It's never been changed. And so I'm, I'm kind of using lots of words to explain this because it is one of the most misunderstood sorts of doctrines. It's one of the misunderstood teachings because people like simple explanations. People gravitate toward simple sweeping sorts of explanations. We see that even with the whole controversy um, with COVID, with the vaccine and all these sorts of things. People don't want to uh, dive down into the facts. What happens is they, they view a very convincing video on YouTube or on Facebook, and, and they just imagine that that's the answer to everything. And this is a childish way to approach things, if I might suggest. It is more adult to recognize that this subject has layers. It's not just one answer about the Sabbath. It has layers. The Sabbath is Saturday. It will always be Saturday. But at the same time, as born-again believers in Jesus, where do you and I find our Sabbath rest? Let me suggest to you, brothers and sisters, our Sabbath rest is not found in a day. It's found in a person. Okay? Our Sabbath rest is not found in a day. It's found in a person. It's found in our relationship with Jesus the Messiah. He is our Sabbath rest. Our Sabbath rest, as the book of Hebrews says, we've entered into the Sabbath rest. We no longer have to wait around six days for the Sabbath to come, but rather we have entered into a Sabbath rest because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so many of these things that were the strictures of Mosaic law are things that we recognize point forward to the greater reality, which is found in the Messiah. So 
again, I'm not preaching against Sabbath. If you want to keep Saturday as a Sabbath day, that is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do that and hold to sound doctrine. There's no a, a problem with that. If you want to hold Sunday as a day of rest, that's fine as well. Uh, most of my worshiping is done on a Sunday because I'm in various congregations. But neither position is something that is mandated in Scripture. That is that is the critical difference. So he says you're you're obligated to mandatory days, the Sabbaths, to months. Uh, most people don't realize that the new moon um, ceremony was a very important ceremony in ancient Judaism. They used to have um, set up bonfires on the hills. If you go to the tops of some of the ridges around Jerusalem and you look one way and then you look the other way, you'll see basically ridge upon ridge upon ridge upon ridge. And you can set a bonfire on the ridge of the Mount of Olives. If the rabbis say, we, we see the new moon, the new moon means, by the way, the first tiny sliver of a brand new moon. So you have the end of the month, the, the moon is waning, and then you have one night where it's gone, one or two nights. And then the first night where there's a thin sliver of moon, that is the day of the new moon. That used to be announced for, in ancient Israel. They used to light a bonfire um, on either side of the two ridges because Jerusalem has ridges around it. And then the Temple Mount itself is on a ridge. So they would light a bonfire. The people on the next ridge who were watching for the bonfire had all the wood ready to go. They would then light their bonfire and on and on and on and on this could go the rabbis claim for hundreds of miles. I think that's an exaggeration. I just was reading the other day that they claimed that the Jewish community in Baghdad would receive news of the, the, new, the new moon that way. It's like a lot of things in Talmud, things were exaggerated. So that's the new moon festival. They observe seasonal festivals, seasons. Um, many of these things are post-biblical. They're not commanded in scripture. They are traditions that the rabbis adopted over the years. They observed years, sabbatical years, jubilee years. These were critical and important during Mosaic law. The church is a brand new entity. And while we have much to learn from Mosaic law, to imagine that somehow it's binding on us, as though our relationship with God was dependent upon our keeping Mosaic law, if you take that position, then you've not fully understood what our new standing is in Messiah. We have a standing as sons and daughters. It's a different sort of standing. And so as a result, in verse 12, um, Paul has... Uh, said to them, starting in verse 12, going on through verse 20, uh, you see that in your outline, that there, the danger here is a loss of liberty. And that would be your fill in there. A danger is the loss of liberty. You become enslaved to all of these traditions. Again, the traditions in and of themselves, singularly, there's nothing bad or wrong about them. But the problem comes when you imagine that you must keep these things as an obligation in order to guarantee your standing with God. That becomes the problem. So let's go on to the next um, PowerPoint slide there, Nigel. And so here, and we're going to go on starting from verse 12, legalism doesn't work because it's contrary to a believer's original faith experience. And we, we had started to touch on this in our last um, gathering. Paul's original relationship with them was, and the word there is selfless. Um, Paul came, as you can read very explicitly in verse 13 and, and 14, Paul did not, <laughs> he did not soften the, the trial that they went through. Somehow, when he arrived at uh, in his previous journey to 
see them. Um, he was looking to to become wealthy. He wasn't. It wasn't promoted. It wasn't something where uh, they had to do, to guarantee him some minimum honorarium, like you see in some of these big mega churches today. They, whenever they have a big name Christian speaker, uh, I've seen the contracts. The big name Christian speaker has a minimum honorarium that he is expecting, whether it be a music group or some famous Christian speaker. And it really um, kind of rubs a lot of folks the wrong way, and I understand that. Paul came in exactly the opposite way. He came in a relationship that was selfless. Um, he did not know if uh, he would have actually even have food to eat. He was probably prepared to stop mending tents if he needed to. So his original relationship with them was selfless. In contrast, if you look at verse 17, the false teacher's relationship with them was selfish. These false teachers of a Pharisaic background were attempting to, to, to bolster their ranks, to gain more disciples, to gain more followers. Um, ultimately, these Pharisees wanted to build their own kingdom, and they saw an opportunity now with this, this messianic teaching. They were kind of in on the ground floor of, uh, of some brand new uh, endeavor. And so these might have been uh, younger men, the younger Pharisees were able to travel, and they saw a new opportunity for them to become well-known, especially among the Gentile believers who, who did not have any loyalty one way or the other yet. So the, the false teacher's relationship with them was a selfish one. They were looking to try to expand the influence of their particular brand of Judaism. And so in verse 18, Paul kind of opens his heart and verse and look at verse 19 he says my children verse 19 with whom i am again in labor until messiah is formed in you for i could wish to be present with you and to change my tone for i am perplexed about you you know paul loved them to the point where it, it's almost a funny illustration here that he he had given birth to them in a sense in his initial trip he had done the initial discipleship and now he says in verse 19 my children with whom i am again in labor until messiah is formed in you he he um, likened his current struggle to convince them of grace to almost having to birth them all over again moms i don't suggest that you use this as a a guilt-inducing argument against your children. Oh, you're giving me so, so many problems. What do you want me to do, to give birth to you all over again? No, that's, that's something my Jewish grandmother would have done. Um, but uh, don't pull that. But Paul was attempting to get through to them. He's hoping for a restored relationship with them. And that's the answer there. He wants a restored relationship with them. Once again, verse 21 is yet another, as if we needed yet another, but yet another clear indication that Paul is flabbergasted that they want to go back unto the law. And so in the translation I'm reading from, it says, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? In other words, he's, he's taking his argument and he's turning it. 10 degrees, 10 degrees, 10. He's, he's expanding and expending every ounce of strength here to take the argument and, and once again turn it. So don't let any of the, the folks in the extreme ends of the Messianic movement, and I've had my battles with them. I'm, I'm part of the Messianic movement, pastored a, a Messianic Jewish congregation as rabbi for, for 17 years, and yet we recognize that the Messianic movement in the particularly in the past 10, 15 years, is is kind of spun out of control. It's it's anyone who knows how to set up a website and make a convincing video can now portray themselves as some sort of authority. And friends, I see this all the time. Um, individuals who were unknown in the messianic community just even five years ago all of a sudden have discovered that if they put videos online 
they start to get flooded with money and donations. Um, and I'm seeing some very sad things and um, just people doing some false teaching. But they look, uh, they look convincing and they have a shtick, they have a, a sort of gimmick, and they're convincing a lot of people, particularly in rural areas, who don't live within driving distance of a messianic congregation, but are hungry to understand the Jewish roots of the faith. Uh, these fellows have become a surrogate sort of congregation for them. And for many of them, they are giving tithes and offerings uh, to these online teachers without fully realizing uh, that they're preaching, in essence, a false gospel. And so once again, in verse 21, he, he says, tell me, you who want to be under law. Does that sound like Paul is preaching law? Again, many of the Messianic teachers would say, oh, no, you don't understand Paul. He wanted them to keep law. He was just trying to express it in a different way. And I say in response, nonsense. Paul had come from keeping Mosaic law. He says it over and over again to try to have them understand that that is not the direction they should be going in. And so he's saying here, he's, he's using now, he's going to turn it 10 degrees and, and use something different. He's going to, to use, and he's going to depart from his usual form of argumentation, and he's going to use an allegory. Now, we need to be very careful here, because the term allegory obviously means that you use an illustration, you use a story, you use a parable in order to teach an eternal truth. The story, the illustration, the allegory is not true. It's not something that is literal. But so why is, why is Paul using it? Because in general, allegory is yet another tool that can help us understand an eternal truth. So Paul is trying to teach an eternal truth, and he's taught it now in five different ways. So now he's going to resort to something that he usually doesn't do. He's going to resort to allegory. Why am I explaining it this way? Here's why. Allegory is seen in very limited places in scripture. It's seen in apocalyptic literature. Obviously, when you look at the book of Daniel, you are seeing figurative speech. You're seeing visions, figures of speech, where Daniel is struggling, as did Ezekiel, <laughs> to put into human words the incredible sight that they were viewing in the heavens. God gave them the option of, of viewing in the heavens this incredible sight, both in the Old Testament, both to to Daniel and to Ezekiel and to other people as well, but those are the two most notable. So in apocalyptic sort of literature, literature that is looking forward to the future that is describing spectacular things in heaven, by necessity, the author has to employ allegory in a sense. He's obviously employing um, illustrations. He's employing figures of speech. He's saying, this is like this, this is like that. An allegory is a slightly different sort of thing as you turn it, because he sets up an entire sort of uh, narrative here, particularly with the two women who were very familiar to them, and that is Sarah, the wife of Abram, and um, Hagar, the, the house servant. And so let me read that portion to you. Um, starting in verse 22, Galatians 4, verse 22. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And now he's going to give them an illustration from law. For it is written that Abram had two sons, one by the bondwoman, the servant, Hagar, and one by the free woman, Sarah. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son by the free woman through the promise. This is an allegory. This contains an allegory. For these women are the covenants. And again, it's an allegory. It's not 
true. It's not literal. He's not saying that these two women are two mountains or that these two women are literally two. It's an allegorical figure of speech. The problem occurs is when people imagine that there's more allegory in the Bible than the Bible itself claims. When there is an allegory in the Bible, you are tipped off in one way or another that this is an allegory. That also then becomes a warning not to start to create allegories when the scripture themselves do not. Why is this important? Because particularly did the Roman Catholic Church over the centuries, particularly over the the 10th, 11th, 12th, 14th century, they created lots of allegories, which basically said whenever a God says good things about Israel, allegorically, he he really means us, the Roman Catholic Church. Oh, but whenever God says bad things about Israel, that must be them Jews. (laughs) That's, That's what the Roman Catholic Church had said, and they used that to justify horrendous violent persecution. Just a horrible subject. And here, when Paul employs allegory, he's going to employ it very, very carefully, understanding that it has the power to to kind of set people off on a rabbit trail. So once again, returning to the text, verse 23, the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. That is Hagar. She gave birth to Ishmael. But the son by the free woman was through the promise. Of course, that is Yitzhak, Isaac. He was born according to the promise. This contains an allegory. For these women are the covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, uh, one, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. And he's likening, <laughs> understand what a, a shot across the bow this was. He's likening Hagar to the legalism of Mount Sinai. Again, Mount Sinai is something that God himself did. Then verse 26 clears it up. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother, just as it is written. And here is a a quotation from Isaiah chapter 54. Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. And you, brethren, verse 28, like Isaac, are the children of promise. How many different ways can Paul say the same thing? That we are not bound to the covenant from Sinai, That is a covenant that is a fleshly covenant. That is what this entire uh, passage says. But rather, we are the children of the free woman. She represents Jerusalem. And so, Paul's reason for using allegory, let's go to the fill-ins here. It is a form of rabbinic interpretation. So they would have been familiar with this uh, sort of allegory. And it is about Abraham, who is a figure of authority. It is about Abraham. That's your fill in there. So this is something that would have been authoritative for them, uh, something that they had become familiar with in their reading. So let's go to the next PowerPoint slide. The next PowerPoint slide tells us that Paul had a way to use allegory. It was A, in your outline, to illustrate spiritual truth. It was to illustrate spiritual truth and not be as an alternative to spiritual truth. We do not use the Bible as a starting place to imagine allegory. Friends, when you employ allegory as your basic method of Bible interpretation, only your imagination determines where you wind up. This is how cults, Christian cults, get their start from some individual leader who imagines that he alone or she alone has been given unusual insight into the meaning of the text and 
how are they given that insight? It's always through an allegorical sort of methodology. In other words, they'll say, when we look at this text, they'll and they'll couch this in very spiritual terms. They'll say, look beyond the mere physical part of this text. Imagine what God is actually trying to say to us here. That's the language that they use. Imagine what God is really trying to say to us here. And then they will tell you what they believe God is trying to say. The only problem is there's no support for that anywhere in the text. They use a text of scripture as a jumping off point, and that allegory takes them to who knows where. They're going to wind up, you know, anywhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not anything that is is rational. Churches which employ allegory as their primary means of understanding the Bible can, on some issues, be very sound. They will tell you that Jesus is the only way, that you have to exercise personal faith in him in order to be saved. Those are all good things. The Bible is the word of God. And there are many churches of the allegorical persuasion who, at the same time, would qualify to be very evangelical. They would hold the Bible to be authoritative. They would hold Jesus to be the only way. But then when you come to the way in which they understand the Bible, very few things are understood literally. Everything becomes an allegory. Yet, the means by which they determine what is allegory and what is literal is purely arbitrary. There is no standard. There is no rule and regulation. So for instance, they'll say, oh, when you read in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem, they'll say, oh yeah, that's literal. The Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. Why? Because they know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Well, in the same book of Micah, it says that God has loved the Jewish people and will never break his covenant with them. The covenant, by the way, is the Abrahamic covenant, not the Mosaic covenant. It's the Abrahamic covenant. But when these allegorizers, some of whom are well known in some of the Reformed churches, when they come to that passage and say, oh, no, that's an allegory, really what God means is us. He means the church. We are the new spiritual Israel. And that form of allegorical interpretation will wind up disenfranchising the people of Israel and then leave them a target that if God has disenfranchised them, maybe we should be God's tool to punish them. In the Holocaust in during World War II, Hitler made statements that are crystal clear, and he said, I am doing the work of God in ending our torture with this this horrendous race. And he said, I am continuing the work of our dear brother Martin Luther when he wrote about the Jews and their lives. Again, he could not separate the idea in Martin Luther of allegory with literal interpretation. He used literal interpretation when it fit his doctrinal statement. He used allegory when it fit his doctrinal statement. Friends, I would encourage you to to recognize that in those few places where the Bible uses allegory, a literal interpretation is impossible. Whenever the scriptures, and here is the famous phrase by Dr. Cooper, who was the president of the Los Angeles Bible Society many years ago, he taught. He, he started the Bible college. Many, he taught many, many students. He said, "Whenever the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, understand each word at its ordinary, plain, usual meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context indicate otherwise." So, when Jesus says, "I am the only way," we understand he is the only way into heaven. When Jesus says, I am the door, he doesn't mean he's a wooden door. 
once again, he's using an allegorical term to imply that he is the only passageway to God. And so in this instance, we have one of the longest uses of allegory in scripture, but we're actually warned, we're actually told very clearly in verse 24, this is an allegory. Okay, these, are, these two women have not become two mountains. One is Sinai, the other is, is the heavenly Jerusalem. But he's using it to try to drive home the message that we are not children of this earthly mountain of Sinai. We are children of the picture of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, verse 26, is free. She is our mother. And he says then in conclusion, verse 28, and you brethren like Isaac are children of promise. Again, he can't say it any more clearly that they're no longer under rabbinic or Mosaic law. And so this is, this is a very clear sort of illustration. Let's go to the next PowerPoint slide there, Nigel, and we'll see this allegory illustrated in this chart. Uh, the whole idea of, of what Paul describes here it might be easier to understand as we view it in the chart. And this, again, this chart originally came from Dr. Michael Rodelnik. Uh, he is now uh, one of the, uh, the senior professors there at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Fine brother in the Lord. Anything he's written, I recommend you, you buy and, and devour. He is, a, he is an excellent writer, very clear. And he was one of my early teachers back in the early 80s. Even though he's two years younger than I am, he was my teacher. And so here, the illustration, once again, is from the life of Abraham. We understand, and you all know the story, uh, that Abraham and Sarah were um, advanced in age, past the usual age at which people bear children, um, you know, way past that age. And they had pretty much given up hope that God would ever give them a child. And so he was about to adopt um, one of his trusted herdsmen who was very close to the family, who had shown a great deal of loyalty to the family. And then he thought to himself, well, maybe, um, and this is Sarah's idea, maybe if you have a son through our bond servant, through our house servant, Hagar. Um, this was not, by the way, from what I read, from what the scholars say, this was not an unusual sort of arrangement. According to um, the scholars, as they've read in ancient Near Eastern uh, manuscripts, um, in the dangerous world of uh, the ancient Near East, this was a way for that many women chose for both safety and to have a child. Um, because of the fact that there were simply more women than men, uh, for the fact that oftentimes uh, these men who were who were uh, well to do uh, would provide for their sons an education, would provide for their sons a name, and they could be assured that their line would be carried on in a very beneficent sort of way. It was uh, something that for many of them was a path that they chose. Uh, yes, certainly through economic necessity and through the realities of looking around and seeing what the situation was. And so here she is, she is the house servant and Sarah uh, recognizes that Abraham wants a son of his own from his own body and not this, uh, this middle-aged uh, shepherd that was a, a loyal servant as well. And so the plan was hatched to circumvent what God had said. You know, it is very easy for you and I to kind of uh, second guess Abraham. Oh, I would not have done that. You know, Abram was, was lacking faith. Uh, yet, given the same circumstances, you have to wonder. I'm not so fast to, to lay blame at the doorstep of Abraham. But later on, he redeems himself. So back to the illustration here. It's very simple. Uh, the works of the flesh were imagining that you can accomplish the plan of God through a work of the flesh, which was here in this convenient 
available sort of solution, quote unquote, which was to have a child by Hagar. And of course that child was Ishmael. Ultimately, God had made a promise to them. And that of course was that Abram would have a child with his wife, Sarah. When Sarah heard this, she Yitzhak, which is the Hebrew word for laughed. And so God said, you're going to Yitzhak. That means the child's name is going to be Yitzhak. Literally, Isaac means laughter. And so they would have a child, Isaac. And ultimately, the works of the flesh, as you see in the chart, are cast out. The works of the flesh will not in the end last. They seem to be plugging a, a need in the moment, but at the end, they're not the plan of God. Whereas God's promise of obtaining an inheritance um, through Isaac is the thing that would last. Because we know as we go through the scripture, God's covenant line went through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob and then to Jacob's 12 sons. That was the line of promise. At the same time, by the way, God had concern for Ishmael. God has concern for Ishmael. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's go to the next chart. There is a second chart here. Hopefully we can squeeze it all onto the, the screen here. So here's the application in verse 24 that we already looked at. The works of the flesh, the things that we attempt to do, working of the flesh, trying to strive to keep a bunch of rules and regulations, that is here likened to the bunch of rules and regulations that we had that were the rule of life for a limited people for a limited time period that came down from Mount Sinai. And that, of course, is Mosaic law. Very clearly, there's no other way to understand this without torturing the text and deliberately misrepresenting it. It's, it's, it's crystal clear. In this same way, though, faith in the promise reinforces the idea that God made a promise to Abraham and to Sarah. As a result, if you're going to continue in the works of the flesh, you're going to have slave children. You're going to have children that are in bondage. Whereas the free children not born under the law were those who came through the line of Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Jacob's um, 12 sons. And so ultimately, there is a casting out for those who attempt to accomplish the plan of God through human works. Once again, the idea of works versus faith is illustrated once again here in Galatians. Ultimately, it is the inheritance, the reward that is promised to those with faith. Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him as righteousness. Did Abraham stumble? Sure he did. A couple of times in Scripture, it's, it's very explicit. But ultimately, Abraham believed God. God reckoned it to him as righteousness. That's why Abraham and Sarah had a child. <laughs> Long past the age of people would have given up. <laughs> There's no point that people would have given up. But they somehow had enough faith to recognize that God was going to keep his promise. So that's the allegory. It's seen there in verse 30. What does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Lest you think that this is somehow um, needlessly harsh on Ishmael, recognize that the very name Ishmael means God has heard. Um, there's a, the most famous phrase in the Hebrew Bible is in Hebrew is the phrase Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is God alone, where the Lord is one. That's a whole nother teaching. But Shema means to listen, but it's in the imperative. Ishmael, the name of Hagar's son, literally means God has heard. So when 
Hagar was sent out, God heard her cry. She did not die. Her son did not die. Ishmael would go on to become the father of many nations. And they are the ones who were given the land to the east of the Jews. Those are the great Arab nations. And they continue to this day. So God kept his promise to them. Um, that's probably a good, we're, we're about to go into chapter five. So this is probably a good time for us to, to take a break. And so I'm going to alert Nigel to 